Okay, hello, welcome back, everyone. And I don't. So, um, yeah, we are beginning with the next part of this course, which is Linux Shell, which is sort of something that you may not use well, you probably will be using it directly a lot, but the main reason we're talking about this now is that it will connect you to, well, it's the necessary oh. stepping stone for other resources. So you could say it's sort of, yeah, like the prerequisite to getting to a lot of things, other things. For example, our HPC Kickstart course next week. Um, but you don't need to be a complete expert here. Just basically being able to follow along and, um, like, not follow along and copy and paste is enough for what you need to do right now. So, first question is why shell? Like, is it too old? Is it too something too boring to read? Actually, first we need to a answer what is shell. Mm -hmm. So, Enrico, how would you describe a shell? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, something that lives underwater. <laughs> Why did they pick this name, actually? Like, yeah. like a shell? Is it really like... I don't so, know. Why? What's the etymology <laughs> behind the... Yeah. So, the yeah. answer is basically... Or at least, I think that the answer is basically... So, there was... Um, so there's the operating system that can't be used directly. And then the shell is the layer around it that connects to the outside world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So here I've shared a shell. And I can type a command, like let's say host name, and then I see an output. Or I can type a program like Python. And then this starts a separate Python shell. So I type something in like, uh, and then I get something out and then I can exit. So, mm, yeah, so is this too old? Like, do you think there's still a use case for this in 2021? Yes, there is, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. It's the it's it's the most basic. It's if we think of the coffee machine with the buttons, you know. Or very often we are not those buttons, those pre-made buttons are not enough. Yeah, yeah. So, and I've been sort of maybe twenty years ago or fifteen years ago, I would have wondered is this shell thing going away? But in reality, it hasn't. So whenever you need to copy and paste, like you need to explain something to someone else, it's much easier to have the shell which gets copied and used somewhere. Um, like for example, can you imagine every single program or every time you need, someone needs to help you with a program, they say, okay, open it, click on this menu, click here, do this, enter this file name, click this button and so on when all of this can be done with one command in shell. So, so what do you mean with this? It's nice that you bring this word command. What do you mean with the mm. command? Well, well, a command is like the things I typed in. And it's basically a program that gets run. Um, but that will actually be the, f we'll get to that in a second or two. Um, Enrico hinted at this other benefit there, which means it's easier to program interfaces. Like writing a graphical program is a lot of work. But writing a shell interface, which is really usable, is something that everyone can do and is quite useful to know how to do. So in this course, it's not like we can teach you everything you might possibly need to know about Shell. Instead, we're going to show you enough to get comfortable so when you see an example from someone else, then you'll feel confident in trying to reproduce it yourself. Or, for example, next week when you come to the HPC course, as we're giving examples in the Shell, you're like, oh, I know what this means, I know how it works, and you can copy and paste and do it yourself. And I see this as more like a, um, learning shell is more like an experience than a course. So 
we show you some basics now, but you'll really learn it as you're using it for other things over time. So any other initial thoughts, Enrico? No, I'm just, in my opinion, it's really nice that we can go through this because I had to learn this myself without <laughs> understanding the, the semantic of things. What's a command? Mm -hmm. What's an option? Mm -hmm. What are arguments? Yeah. I've, I had no idea when I started, but then I understood that it makes sense. So yeah. So what is a command? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK. So maybe we can start with the basic principles. So there's input and there's output. So input is from the keyboard, like here as I'm typing, and output goes back to the screen. So the internal terms here are standard input and standard output. So I type, let's do this again, host. Let's type date. So date is a command. So there's a program on the computer called date, which will be run when I push enter. And the program runs, and then it says, this is the output on standard output, and then the shell comes and displays it back to us here. So programs can have options and arguments. So for example, date, um, let's see, does this work? Yeah, so here I've given yeah. a really weird looking argument to date, plus percent %s. So percent %s means Unix time. So now instead of printing the date in a human form, it's printed the date in um, the number of seconds since January 1st at midnight, 1970. Or I can give it some other options like, uh, let's see if this works. So here I've told date to print the year and the month and the day. So as far as the shell concerned, there's just the command and then any other options you may give. And it's so up the, to th yeah. Can I ask, is, is the command always coming first? That is like, that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's the order that we need to run and yes. then you pass some. The command always comes first. So here you see a plus sign, plus is not special. That just sent to the date program. But the minus, if an option begins with a dash, it's called a option instead of an argument. So here, if I do date dash h, it says invalid option, dash dash help. So here now date has printed out all of this help here, which unfortunately it's sort of scrolling off the screen. So it looks bad. Let me do it again. Okay, here we go. You can't see it all, but that's okay. So dash dash help is a common option that many different programs have. And we can see date dash u, utc, and other things like this. So let's try the dash u option for date. Date dash u. And I see now it shows UTT, utc time zone. So um, other programs will have, say, file names as options. So what we'll get to this shortly, but like copy file1.txt, file2.txt. And you can combine options and arguments. It's like cp-i and these things. But this will really start making sense once we start seeing actual programs that are using these things. Okay. What is the what is the best way to get the list of all the options? Like if now you used CP minus I, is that a so the dash H or dash help. So here again, this wants us to do dash help. It tells us all of the options okay. like here. There's also something called the manual pages, which we'll see a little bit later, which tells you even more options. Okay, so one thing that can sort of confuse some people is that Unix and shells are generally very quiet. So if something is successful, it will 
say nothing. So for example, you say, I want to make a copy of this file. And then it just does it and it doesn't say anything. And that means, good job, it worked. Okay, so what about files? So files are represented by names, just like in other things. So it's a sequence of characters. So here in my, this computer here is our cluster Triton, which we will be using, which we'll be using um, next week in the course. So if I type ls, I see all the different files that are on Triton. So here's a file called time.l, and here's a file called time.sh. Directories are represented by slash. So for example, I can do ls. So ls means list the files, test. And now I can see what's in this test directory. So notice that I can leave off the slash and it still lists what is inside of the directory. But if I want to list test2, I can do ls test slash test2. And there I see a subdirectory. Okay, um, let's see. So that's files, yeah, that's how file, the general files are represented. So on Unix, files can contain any character except a slash, because slash is a directory separator. But most people try to avoid using spaces and using basically standard characters. Okay, so we have files, so how do you edit files? So Enrico, how do you edit files via the shell? So I use a software called VI. <laughs> I know that yeah. sometimes people mock VI because it's very difficult to quit it, but uh, yeah. I guess it's not the only one. I'm, I'm sure yeah. there's something easier than... Oh. So, how, how do you edit? Yeah, so I'll use the competing program called Emacs, but we're not actually going to talk about either of these programs right now. <laughs> Instead, what we're going to talk about is the general will use something called nano. But let's say you're connected to Triton. You may be used to editing files with a graphical program, which are great because they have a lot of power and have lots of buttons to click and so on. But um, it can be really convenient to be able to edit from the shell. Or more precisely, we're editing from the terminal and the shell is running inside of the terminal. So I saw a program called time.sh. So I'll use nano and then time.sh and i'm recommending nano here just because it's a very simple editor and um is installed on many different computers so nano time.sh and i see the contents of the file so uh, there's when you're editing programs on your computer, you maybe use things like word format, but when you're at the level of shell, the most common thing is um, uh, just a plain text format. So this is nothing but the raw characters here, no formatting, nothing beyond what you see, which is basically how people do programming. Okay. Um, so you can type things, so I'm adding an extra command here, and a great thing about nano is it tells you how to exit it. So it says control X to exit. So on my keyboard control X, it asks me do I want to save, I will type Y for yes, and then give the name and it is saved. Okay. Oh, can so, you? So now you open Nano because you wanted to edit the file. But what if I just want to check the file? Uh, what's yeah. inside the file without? Yeah. So when I'm just want to look at a file, there are several different options. Often I will use a program called Less. So why is it called Less? So originally, it there was a program called More, and someone decided to write something called Less because well, Less is More. 
anyway, that's like all funny history. Um, and less is called a pager. So let's look at time.sh. So now here I see just the concept of the contents of the file, no editing. And I can push the up and down arrow keys to scroll, except there's nothing to scroll. And I can do Q to exit. Let's try to find a longer thing. Um, I'm scrolling up to try to find a longer program. I wonder what singularity script is. Less space singularity script. So again, the program to run and then the argument is the file name. Okay, this is not very long. Let's try something else. Test debug.py. Okay, this is also short. Hmm, let's say long program. Let's look at one of the outputs here. I don't know if you have any, like, so now you're opening or you're using files that they are basically text only files, like mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier. What happens if you run less? With, uh, I don't know if you have anything that is not the text there, but... Yeah, so here's a non-text file. So this is the Python program itself in a virtual environment. So I see it says, warning, this may be a binary file. Do I want to yeah. see it anyway? I'll do yes, and I see a bunch of madness here. So opening this in an editor doesn't really make sense. Okay. So what about listing and moving files and so on? So that's a quite common thing to do. So as I said before, ls is the command that lists files. There's a program called makedir, which will make a new directory. So I'm gonna make a directory called shell demo. And I change to shell demo here. And now I will do ls. And it looked like ls didn't work. But that's because if there's nothing to list, as I said, Unix is very quiet, so just um, print nothing. OK, let's make a file. Nano. This is a file. Uh, test, test. And then I will Control X and save. OK. Mm, okay. So now if we ls, we see the file appears. Okay, let's say I want to make a copy of it. Copy file onetxt to .txt. And now I ls. And there we go. Let's say I want to copy it again. There's file 3txt here. So notice I didn't type this whole command again. This is history of the shell, which I'll talk about later. It really saves you a lot of keystrokes. So let's see how else we can list. ls-l lists even more. So it says not only the file name, but when it was modified, and then who owns it, and then the properties of the file, which we really don't need to go into right now. Let's say you want to rename a file. How does that work? Well, rename is the same as move. So I can do move file one to file zero.txt. And now let's list. And we see file one is gone and file zero is there instead. So let's go to one of the biggest traps of the shell. Move file two.txt. Now I'm moving file2 to file0.txt, and file0.txt already exists. So what does this mean? So it didn't complain. It just worked. So let's list it. And we notice that file2 is gone and file0 is still there. So really, file zero got deleted and file two got moved on top of there. So many of these shell commands don't give you any warning before 
doing something that might erase a file. So when using these, I always think a little bit before I push enter. Let's try running the same command again. And we see if you do something that actually doesn't work, it actually does print an error message. Okay. If we what about to... uh, if, if you were not, I mean, there's no way to undo, right? If you, if you accidentally overwritten the... Yeah. So here we're at such a low level, there's no undoing. So if you are on an Alto computer, there may be snapshotting where you can go to a snapshot directory and get old versions of files back. And when you're using Linux or Windows or Mac and you delete something through the file browser, it saves the copy because um, Let's see, so it saves like the tr trash can recycle bin, that kind of concept is made by the graphical interface and not by Linux itself. Okay, let's see. Maybe, I mean, before you move to something else, would that be an option that would prevent me to, you know, to get a warning that, you know, maybe, mm. so MV with some option, yeah, and I and see. I would get a warning that file. Three. So let's try the same thing with file three and file zero, but now we'll add the dash i option here. And i means does it mean interactive or? I think well, it's anyway, interactive, yeah. probably interactive. But here it says, "Do you want to overwrite the file?" So it gives us a warning, and I'll say no. Um, but if I do file3 to file4.txt, there's no warning because it's safe. And in fact, some people use the dash i option on move, copy, and remove in order to prevent this from happening. Okay, um, what about to remove a file? So there's a command called rm, so we can remove file4.txt, just like this. And do you think it will give us any warning? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> of course not. It's just gone. And we can list again. And we see everything here. Well, just file zero. OK, so I already demonstrated the make their command. So make your new directory, and now if we ls, we see new directory here. So why do you think new directory is colored with a slash on the end? So this is just a property of the bash shell. So the bash shell takes this and says, like for convenience, is giving the different directories to different type kinds of files different colors. So Linux itself knows nothing about these colors or anything. And in fact, this slash is also added by bash and is not actually part of the file name. So now that we're talking about directories, there's something that can be a little bit confusing. So when you're in the graphical interface, if someone asks, what directory are you in, does this even mean something? Like there may yeah, be. I mean, with 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 the graphical interface, you would use like a browser, right? Like a file browser, mm -hmm. and there you see the directories. So are you you are basically saying that these directories are the same that we would see with the file browser? Can we also get you know yeah. a location of where where we are in the file system? Mm -hmm. Would you is, is there a command for that? Yeah. So if I type the command pwd, which means print working directory, we see it says. I'm in the directory home, darstar1, shell demo. And yeah, so when you're in the graphical interface, there's not really this concept of what directory you're in. Like you might be in a file browser that has a certain directory open, but that doesn't really relate to other things. But here, when you're in the command line, there's always a concept of working directory. So this is my working directory. And it's basically like where I'm standing. And all of my directions are relative to here. So for example, here I can list the new directory. 
and there's nothing in there. I can list the parent directory, which is dot dot, which is my home directory. And then I see what's up there. If I, um, yeah. So this can be useful. So you start a project and then you change to that project's directory and then you don't have to give the full path to files in there. You give everything relative from that directory. And the command to change the working directory is cd. So for example, I will cd to new directory and now I'm in here. And if I do ls, I see nothing because there's nothing in new directory. If I do ls dot dot, I see the parent directory. And you notice there's a bash history file here. This is something I've done just for my shell. So I have a per directory bash history. If you do cd with no arguments, it changes to your home directory. And if you see right here, there's a tilde. Tilde traditionally represents your home directory. Um, so now that I'm in home directory, I can do ls shell demo new directory and then get to that. The root of all files on any Unix computer is the root directory, which is represented with slash, like this. So if I do ls here, I see this is everything that's on the whole computer. And here you see different mounts. There's the scratch file system that Enrico was talking about before. Under M, um, there are different other file systems mounted and so on. Um, I can do ls tilde and list just my home directory again, or tilde slash shell demo, and then um, that. So if you would type cd and then tilde, it would be the same as just typing cd. It just goes to your home. Exactly. So here I've gone back to my home directory. Okay. And maybe one concept that I found difficult when I started. So if you type pwd, you, you, you're you asking the system, where am I? Mm -hmm. And you were saying that dot dot is the parent. Mm -hmm. So dot dot automatically sees where you are and just returns the, the top the previous level so now would be home yeah. so okay. if i go to shell demo if i do ls with a dash a option this means list all directories actually let's do everything and then long listing so here we see in shell demo there's also a dot dot directory in here which, which is, which is, is a the link parent. to the parent directory. Yeah. But this and is what is the dot? Dot is current directory. So basically every directory also has a link to itself. So if I do cd dot, I end up in the same place. Which actually that's a good point because dot represents the current directory. So if I do ls dot slash new directory, from my current directory, list the new directory. But all these listing things are things that won't really come up in your day-to-day -day life. Well, I mean, I guess it could. Um, actually, yeah, maybe understanding the concept of the directory you're in and how it relates to other directories is one of the most confusing things to get used to. Yeah. Anyway, anything else about directories? No, I'm thinking now it's 1.30. You cover yeah. basically all the comments you wrote, all the comments that I type daily. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah this is basically it. <laughs> but um, I noticed that you are so well, you already talked about the dash dash help to get some help. And I think you also mentioned about this man, or did you mention about it? I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, so another way to get help is the manual pages. So man for manual, let's type man ls. And here, this actually starts the less program again. And now I can use the up and down arrow keys to scroll. So I scroll down and I can see these are all the different options for LS. So does someone actually need to know all of these options? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, the only thing you need to know is that if you needed to make LS do something special, 
you have this manual page. So the most common less commands for me are slash, like slash, so slash searches. So I can search for sort and I see, okay, under description, it says sorting things. If I push the lowercase n, it searches for the next um, thing. And well, there's all these different sorting options here. And then Q to quit. Okay, I could say man less to see how less works. And I noticed that at the top, you also have some, like when you type man less at the very beginning, mm. you also see this minus minus help and all this. Is, is it yeah. like a summary of all the, of everything? Yeah, so like manual pages typically have um, the summary at the top, a basic description, the different commands, and now I'm using page down to scroll faster. Some of these manual pages can be quite long. Okay, key binding sections. If you go all the way down, it tells you about the author, copyright, other useful programs to see, configuring the program with environment variables, and well, lots of stuff there. At the bottom some of, of some of them, there's examples, which can be really helpful. Okay, um, I already talked about help, so there's less dash help. And actually here you notice that less dash help, instead of printing something, it opens less with its help screen internally. So basically the help options is up to the program to process, not up to the shell. Okay. So there's history and tab completion in the shell. So. You may think this is a lot of typing to be doing, and you'd be sort of right. So there is not a good, like you may think it's easier to move the mouse, but in reality, there's some things that make shell a lot faster. First, if I push the up arrow key, it scrolls through the history. So I can find old commands that I have run and rerun them. So let's see, like for example, I found a CD slash again which is really so short I would have just typed it, but well, the point stands. Or I can scroll up to find something and then edit it. Let's say I want to list new directory. So now I'm in root. So the other thing that's really helpful is tab completion. So I want to type shell demo, but I don't want to actually have to type it. So I type sh and then I push tab. And notice everything just got completed there, which is amazing. And now I type ne for new and I push tab. And there I go, I get the directory. And now I can list it. So if I do this um, from the start ls slash shell tab new tab, I can type things amazingly fast like this. So it can complete file names. Some other programs can complete options or subcommands or many different things. So basically, as you're using the shell, you'll be pushing tab a lot. Um, if I have a directory and I push tab, so I pushed it once and nothing happened because it's not a unique completion. If I push it again, now I can have it list everything in my home directory. So um, ls tilde slash test. So let's say I do test and now I push tab. I can see everything that starts with test. And test.slurm. And now I can use the left and right arrow keys to scroll back and I change list to less. And now I can open something. So these kind of convenience things can really change your life. And there's even more that I don't routinely use, but is quite good to know. Would that okay. be a command where you can easily see the whole history mm. that you, you know, instead of going up and down with the arrow? Yeah, so there's history that should list all of my history. Let's okay. see what happens. 
a lot got scrolled by. So it shows the command numbers and everything there. And I can Save. scroll on up and see whatever. Okay. So next I was going to talk about variables. So this sort of gets close to shell scripting, but I think it's important to know a little bit here. So what if I do echo dollar home? So dollar home is a what's called an environment variable. So this is a property. The environment variable is a property of Linux itself. Using dollar to access it is a property of the shell. So basically what happens when I do echo home, bash takes echo home and converts it to echo this. And then you get the output. So you can set can you your make own also your own yeah, exactly can you set your own variable yeah so if, if you want to give it another name a b c d equals um let's call it demo demo equals shell demo and i push enter and now what happens if i do cd dollar demo now i go to shell demo so there's actually two kinds of variables here. There is shell variables, and then there are environment variables. And for the purposes right now, you don't really need to know the difference between them. But um, the environment variables are set with export in Bash. And environment variables also get seen by other programs you run, but shell variables do not. But this is a distinction which is not important right now. OK. So you can access the variables using dollar uh, demo like this, or with curly braces like this here. What do you think will happen if I just do demo like this? Does it try to run it? As you said earlier, that the first thing is always the command. Mm -hmm. Is it that now this would be a comment? Yeah, so the shell expands that to the command. So that's the same as running this here, where it's just trying to run the directory as a command. And bash says, well, I can't execute a directory. So, yeah. What if you, if, what if you store in this demo variable a comment? <laughs> would it run? Or? Let's see. So let's do demo equals cd um, demo. So notice I'm using quotes here, cd shell demo. So now I have to find this and let's type demo. Hmm. So here we see the problem is that, um, wait, cd Okay, so but it, it was working like it, it, it ran the command. It's just that it didn't find that maybe because the oh, yeah, could it be that the tilde is it, it's not expanded mm. because now that the tilde yeah. is just a string and this and the shell doesn't. Okay, let's try this. So instead of tilde, I'll use home and now I type demo. There we go. Yeah, yeah. So this what you just saw is not important for this initial shell demo, <laughs> yeah. but sort of shows that there's a certain order that bash evaluates the commands. And um, yeah, all I can say is if you notice weird things happening, then you can ask someone and maybe they can provide some advice. And as you get more experience, these will start making sense and you will think that you can do anything okay let's see yeah and for so... example on triton we set some initial variables like cd work there which goes to your personal directory in scratch or then i'll go back to demo so you may notice whenever you're copying examples it will say things like um like run this command s batch i 
so it will say copy this command and run it and where script name you're supposed to replace that yourself with the script name you're running so basically it's not being used as a variable in the shell but a variable in our demo to um go to yeah it's a variable in our demo that you replace before you run the command it's like here okay it did nothing okay because so, you didn't have that variable right yeah because that variable was not defined so it was the same as just running s batch which yeah. does nothing and i push Control c to cancel a program that's currently running so that sort of brings us to the end of the demo part here um so what comes next there's a program called ssh which lets you connect to other computers and run things so for example to connect to triton like i have here i've done ssh triton.alto.fi or my username at triton.alto.fi and then that gets you the shell somewhere else but that's sort of not one of the core concepts of this course and you can uh, find instructions on doing this later and we'll do this for the um, shell or we'll do this in the kickstart next week yeah I think the best way to learn shell is basically to use it so start it up and use it to um, run your code to move files around, operate on the computer, and try to pick up some things, see what other people do. Mm. So how about... Yeah. Okay, you use your shell daily, and there are all these commands. Do you need to type all these commands one after the other, or can you connect the commands you talked mm. about? Yeah, so that that's sort of... Did I already say in the first part of this today's workshop? So you write programs to run other programs. So everything here I'm typing just for once. But let's look at some of these other things like this test.sh program. No? Oh, uh, uh, I need to go back to my home directory. So it said test.sh does not exist. So cd to my home directory, use history. Okay, there's still not a test.sh. Test.slurm. So here we see what is basically, this is a shell script. So the top few commands let it run on the cluster. But here I've basically taken the same commands that I would run myself, and then I can run them um, automatically. So basically, you it's a very small step from running stuff in the shell to running um, batch jobs um, like scripting your other work, which is really important for whenever you need to do big data analysis or things like that. So you need to run the same program a thousand times or a million times. You're not going to run that yourself. You have to make a shell script and use these kinds of tools. So shell is itself a complete programming language. So you have conditionals, if, then, else. You have loops, for, and while to do basically whatever you need. And for very basic things, you need just some basic commands. But as you do more and more, you will learn even more about this. Um, you can do math in a shell. So for example, I'll set x equal to 5. And here x is not uppercase. And that's, it's still a shell variable. So if I do echo dollar, uh, uh, let's see. So here I've done some math. So. By the point you start doing math in the shell, maybe you're going a little bit too far, but it can be useful for scripting when you're running a million jobs and you need to adjust something for each of the different jobs. Um, there's pipes. I think it would be good to talk about as yeah. maybe one of the last things. So um, you can run 
programs. So, so here, words, I will open this, is a file that contains, well, it says about half a million words in the English language, which is used for spell checking and stuff like that. So there's a program called grep, which will print words matching a pattern. So let's say I wanted to print every word beginning in CS, for example. So this caret symbol means beginning of line. So here I printed, um, yeah, these things, which these don't really look like words. So I guess there's not really that many words that begin in that. But now I want to see how many different um, commands are in here. So there's another program called WC, which means word count. And I do this. And now word count prints the number of lines in the input, the number of words, and the number of characters. So what if I combine these two? So grep this to print out every word that begins in CS, and then word count prints you the number of lines, the number of words, and the number of characters. So I've just told myself the number of different, um, the number of different words in this file that begin in CS. And Unix is all about composing these different um, things together. So the idea isn't you make one program that does everything, but you have a lot of different small programs that can all be connected together with these pipes. And you can do, well, pretty much anything. So basically, the idea would be that this would be like having blocks, where the first block is this grep, etc., etc., and this gets executed first, right? And then the output of that is sent to this other command, WC. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. how it is. Yeah. And this is really beyond the course right now. I'm just letting you know something you might see later, and you can experiment with it. So what would come next? So there's a lot of different online guides for bash and shell scripting. One of my, well, the one I learned from was called the Advanced Bash Scripting Guide. I've heard there might be something more modern now. Within Science IT, we have a Linux shell tutorial course, which I don't know when we will do it again. OK, someone's writing it in the HackMD here. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a resource that's useful for scientific purposes. Like as a scientist, you might have some useful stuff here. Um, at least that's sort of the mindset we use when writing it. And well, sort of when you have a problem you can search shell and then what you want to do or bash and what you want to do and you can usually find someone that doesn't if maybe alt, there's a nice question there's a nice question in the AKMD because we are getting soon it's time for a break yeah but what about this path variable mm -hmm. that this is something that you know you will come across the path <laughs> yeah <laughs> da daily <laughs> yeah so dollar path is an environment variable I printed. And so internally in Unix, this is what it used to find, uses to find what to run. So here path has something user lib qt 3.3 bin and so on. If I go through, I see here's something in my home directory, a bin directory. So bin basically means executable files. So when I type date, how does bash know what to run? So it searches every one of these different directories here from left to right and finds the first one that has date in it and runs it. So I bet that date is in here. No, okay. Uh, could it? Ah, that's user local bin. Maybe it's in user bin. And there we go, that's date. If I want to see where bash is finding a program from, I can use something called type. 
type date and it says date is hashed and this is where it finds it from and type itself is not a program it's built into bash because bash can't start another program to tell it what's happening inside of bash so like type type we see type is a shell built in okay any other questions to well there was, there was a nice long long discussion on why do we need linux is it mm -hmm. good is it bad of course it yeah. goes a bit beyond of the topic mm -hmm. here but yeah for those who are interested you know they can join the discussion there and yeah i guess maybe I mean, a, another interesting thing somebody was asking can i copy several files at the same time mm -hmm. sometimes it's useful so let's go to shell demo uh, let's copy let's say i want to copy both bash hist and file zero to new directory copy file zero bash hist so when you're copying, if the last argument in copy or move is a directory, instead of giving it that name, it will copy it inside of that directory. So I have this new directory and it's there. So if we wanted to be refreshed about how this worked, what would we do? We can look at the help. So the long thing, scroll up, and we see the different options. So you can copy something from a source file to a destination file, or copy a source file, and dot, dot, dot means possibly more source files to a directory. Or copy to a directory, possibly multiple source files. So, yeah. To comment on the, is it good to use Ubuntu or Linux in general when working as a researcher? So these days, the advantage is less. So really, like Bash Shell can also run on Windows. Bash Shell runs on Mac and so on. So what we're talking about here, while Linux is sort of under it, the lessons here are equally usable for other operating systems. Um, so I think it's useful to learn to use the shell well. Like to me, part of the benefits of me using Linux in the past was basically forcing myself to do things the hard way, because the hard way shows you what's going on inside and makes it easier for you to do things the easy way later. But these days on Windows, there is Windows services for Linux which can run all of this Ubuntu and shell and everything for Windows integrated to the operating system, which I hear is pretty nice and I think would get you the same benefits. Um, but yeah. Okay. Are there major differences between less and more? Who wants the history of how these things came to be, or at least my theory of the history. So first, th when there was Unix, people needed a way to look at files. So you would cat a file, uh, share, dick, words. Notice my nice use of tab completion here to basically make this magically appear. So cat means concatenate. And for practical purposes, it means take the file and dump the contents to the screen. So here we see it's printing, well, one or half a million lines to the screen. And this is actually a sort of good lesson here. So the input and output and printing stuff can be the slowest part of your program running. So cat can print the whole file, or let's say test.slurm. So here I've printed a single file. And this works well when it's short. But then when something is long, like words, there was more, which is basically cat, but you push enter and it scrolls down, or space and it scrolls down by one screen. But you can't scroll up and down, so you can only go down. And being able to scroll up is pretty useful. So then less came. 
that lets you scroll down and scroll up and do a lot more different things. Like for example, unless I can push ampersand and then do test. And here now it's printing only the lines that match test. So all of these lines have a test in there somehow. And I can search test and it will, oh. Okay, it's doing, yeah, there it goes. It's just quite slow because it's searching the whole file here and showing test. So which one is best for you? Well, it really is up to you. So um, I use, well, I use cat and I use less most often. Why do some options have a single dash and some have double dashes? Yeah, so this is all up to the program. So some older programs will only have the single dash options. So more modern programs have double dash and single dash. And basically with single dash, you can combine them like ls-la, which is the same as ls-l-a. But when you do hell or uh, no, well, I don't know what the equivalent for the L option is, but if there's long, then you have to have a different option for all, and you can't combine it like that. And this is basically part of the user interface guidelines. So over the uh, decades that shells have existed, people have really refined these to come up with what they think is the best standards. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, it's almost 2 p.m. So we'll have a little break and then what yeah. would be the next, the next part? Yeah, so now we're going to stop the stream and we will go only so if you're coming to the high performance computing kickstart next week next week you have a zoom link and we'll go there for installation help time so basically if you're having trouble getting connected to the cluster we can help you there and if not then well that's all so if you're coming next week, please make sure that you have the cluster account and you're able to get connected and get the shell on the cluster. Otherwise, you'll be behind and there's basically nothing we can do to um, keep it, um, like to help you catch up by then because we'll be focused on the new teaching. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then like this to was thank hopefully everyone. very useful. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone that answered questions in the HackMD, um, or that asked and answered there. So I can share it here. Let's see. Yeah, it actually works. So you can see that people have all of these. These are all questions that people have asked and answered. And we'll post these on the workshop webpage. There. Okay, well, thanks everyone for watching. Oh, one last thing, please give feedback. So at the very bottom of the HackMD, um, we're making a feedback section. So please tell us one thing that went well and one thing that can be improved. And both of these are very important. Since this is the first time we've done it by Twitch and with the vertical screen layout and everything like this, it's really important that we um, hear what you think about things. So please give comments there. It's really important to us. Okay, well, with this, Excellent. we'll stop the stream and get going. <laughs>